thanks. Thanks very much, Tracy, for that lovely introduction. So we're going to take you on a multi-sensory inspection of the universe. I've written here that headphones would be recommended because you get a better experience. So if you happen to have some headphones lying around your desk or, or just nearby, I would suggest grabbing those now and plugging them in. It's not necessary, but it, it just might give you a slightly better sound experience. So without further ado, let's, let us begin. But before we, we, get, we launch into our tour, we like to give you the take home message just so we can give you it at the beginning. Hopefully we'll convince you this by the end of the talk. So what we want to convince you this evening is that there's a huge potential for multi-sensory approaches to astronomy, education and research with benefits for both accessibility and for scientific discovery. Let's see if we can convince you of that by the end of the talk. We've already had an introduction about ourselves, but just to quickly like gauge why, why we're here. So I'm, I'm Chris, I'm an astronomer mostly, but over the last two years, I've become more and more interested in how we can take multi-sensory approaches to astronomy, both for engagement and education reasons, but also for research. And in particular, I'm, I'm leading this project that we call Audio Universe that will be launching this year, all about how we can use sound to represent astronomical data. More of that as we go through the talk. And Nick? Uh, yeah, so I, as, as uh, I was introduced, I guess I'm also an astronomer, um, somebody with a vision impairment. Um, I actually jumped pretty quickly uh, after I finished my PhD into outreach and public engagement work, and it became really obvious to me quite quickly that I wanted to do stuff uh, to help other people who are blind and vision impaired learn about astronomy. Um, because growing up as somebody with an interest in space, it wasn't always particularly easy for me to to access the things that I needed to to learn about the subject that I was so passionate about. Um, so at the moment, I lead a project called the Tactile Universe, uh, which you can sort of think of as a sister project to the audio universe. Uh, we've been working for a couple of years to develop uh, tactile resources that are sort of a different way of communicating some of those beautiful images of space that you might be used to looking at, but uh, in, a, in a way that can be felt rather than seen. Oh, thanks, Nick, and yeah, and more of that as we go through. So just to get us started, let's just give ourselves a perception of what we can actually see in the universe. So if you're having full sight, let's sort of put into context how much of the universe we can actually see. So when we go outside and look up at the night sky, if you, you can see the stars, these just look like pinpricks of light on the backdrop of the blackness of space. Nothing much other than these sort of little pinpricks of light. But every star that we can see when we go outside is within our own Milky Way galaxy. But what we want to ask you, and we want you to think about this for a second, is how many of the stars in the Milky Way can we see on a, on a night? So let's imagine there's no clouds. Let's imagine we're in a pretty dark site away from the lights of the city. We want to ask you this question. Roughly, what percentage of the stars in the Milky Way galaxy can we see with the naked eye? So we've got some answers for you here. 20% of the stars in the Milky Way we could see, maybe. 2%. 0.02% or 0.0002%. And to help put those numbers in a bit more context, A means one in five of the stars we could see with our naked eye, B is one in 50 of the stars, C is one in 5,000, and D would be one in 500,000. So I'll just give you a little moment to think about that before we reveal the answer. So maybe it's no surprise to you that the answer is D, in terms of going out with the naked eye, looking at the night sky, we can only see about 2,000 of the 100 billion stars inside our Milky Way galaxy, which corresponds to about one in 500,000. So really, that's a tiny fraction of the stars in the Milky Way that we can see with the naked eye. But there's a lot more out there, right, Nick? No, there absolutely is, Chris. So um, a really good example of just how much extra stuff there is out there that we uh, can't see just using our naked eye um, is some of the observations that the Hubble Space Telescope has made during its lifetime. Um, so a number of years back, the Hubble Space Telescope pointed at a very particular patch of sky. This patch of sky was around about the same size uh, in length as about a tenth of the full moon. So a really, really tiny patch of sky. Hubble pointed at that for the equivalent of about 11.3 days. Uh, so it took images for that length of time to expose the light in that region of space. And 
just in that tiny patch of sky, it was able to uh, basically observe around about 10,000 individual galaxies. And when we think about the number of stars per galaxy, most of those galaxies on average would have had somewhere around about 100 uh, billion stars each. So that's a lot of extra stuff just in that tiny patch of sky. We can sort of extrapolate those numbers to the rest of the sky and we get a number around about 2 trillion for the total number of galaxies we think uh, would be visible in the night sky if we could actually see them all. Okay. Still with you, Nick. Yep, sorry. I can't actually see the screen, so I'm kind of winging it. Um, That's fine. We've got the, uh, the, the, the pie chart of the universe. Fantastic. Okay, uh, so one of the other bigger issues, of course, is that um, only a tiny fraction of the matter in the universe um, is actually visible. Um, so about 4.6% of the matter in, in the overall sort of universe's uh, energy budget um, or sort of mass energy budget rather is actually uh, visible. There's a whole lot of stuff out there called dark matter uh, which isn't visible in any wavelength. Um, we can only infer its existence based on how the things around it uh, act and move. And then a massive chunk of the, gal uh, of the universe rather is made up of this stuff called dark energy. So just a tiny, tiny fraction is actual physical stuff that we can see. It gets even worse though, because only a tiny fraction of that 4.6% uh, of the, the overall universe is actually matter that's luminous, uh, so contained within stars uh, and gas that's being uh, uh, lit up basically by fusion and other processes like that. So, so much of the universe is dark to us. And then when we think about uh, all of the different kinds of light that objects can emit, um, the stuff we can actually see with our eyes, the visible part of the spectrum is only a tiny, tiny fraction of the overall electromagnetic spectrum. So we have objects that emit in X-rays, in radio, in ultraviolet, in uh, gamma rays, all of these other parts of the electromagnetic spectrum that we can't see just using our eyes. So uh, we need to be a little bit clever about how we see the majority of the universe. Yeah, thanks, Nick. Uh, apologies, I forgot to stop sharing the slides. But part of <laughs> start sharing the slides. But part of the point is to not be able to see. So we'll carry on with the slides ahead of us. Thanks, Nick. So building on what Nick just said about looking beyond the visible light. So as Nick said, there's only this tiny fraction of the electromagnetic spectrum we can see uh, that's sort of detectable by by our eyes. But we can learn so much by going beyond the visible. So I've got a little example galaxy here to sort of talk through what you might learn if you go beyond the visible light. So I'm showing on the screen an image of a galaxy called Centaurus A. In the background, there's some stars, but these are mostly associated with the Milky Way. The point of interest is a ball of light at the center of the image. And this is the collective light from hundreds of billions of stars inside this galaxy. And then going right across the middle of this bulge of light are some dark patches, some dark rains. And that's intervening material, dust and gas that's in the way, stopping us see some of that light. And that's what we get if we look in the visible part of the spectrum. But if we look at the same galaxy in infrared light, so we're now going beyond red into the infrared, we see something very different. In this image now, we do not see this bulge of uh, starlight, but we mostly see that those streaks of dark patches that were in the optical image are now glowing. So these patches of dust glow in the infrared. So it's being warmed up by the starlight and then it re-emits in this infrared wavelength. If we look at the radio wavelengths, we see something completely different. We don't see any of this dust. We don't see any of the starlight. Instead, we see these giant lobes or regions of uh, material above and below the galaxy. And what we're seeing here is the energy emitted from highly charged and energetic particles that are being launched away from the galaxy by a supermassive black hole at the center of this galaxy. A completely different physics that we're learning about this galaxy by going into the radio wavelengths. And if we go to the other end of the spectrum, into the X-ray wavelengths, we can see a little bit more what's going on with these charged particles. We see coming above and below the galaxy, narrow beams of charged particles, which are we call radio jets, um, which we see in the X-rays as well. And then around these regions, we're seeing these hot gas. So what's happening are these charged particles are going into the gas around this galaxy and heating it up. So we can learn so much by be going about this galaxy by going beyond the visible. But I've shown you these pictures as though they're real pictures and real images. 
that we so could maybe see with the naked eye. But these are, of course, not real images, particularly the ones that are not able to see with our naked eye, as in somebody has, has to have taken the data from the telescope, heavily processed it, and then decided to turn it into some color. So for, in the infrared image, someone made a decision to make that red. In the radio image, somebody make a decision to make that pink. Of course, it's just been turned into something that looks beautiful. And even some of these images are not even recorded at the telescope as images at all. So the radio image, for example, is actually taken by several sat dish dishes spread over a patch of the ground. And the data is recorded as data tables. So it's looking at how the radio waves arrive at the different antenna at different times. And it's really stored as a data table. And then there's a lot of processing that goes in to turn that into an image. So let's reflect on where we're at, at the moment. So Nick told us that most of the universe is dark and doesn't even emit any light at all. Of the light that is emitted, only a tiny fraction is emitted in the visible part of the spectrum, which is detectable by the human eye. To detect any of the light, we need special telescopes and cameras to, to collect that light. And we nearly always decide to turn all of that data into fake color images or visual plots from the data. So that, even though the universe is basically invisible, the standard way to do research and to communicate information about the universe is to make images and visual plots. But why? We don't have to always take that approach. Right, Nick? No, absolutely not. And so there are actually a lot of advantages to turning data into sound, uh, turning data into tactile images. Uh, there are things that we're going to be able to detect with our ears that we won't be able to see. And there are things that we'll be able to feel more easily than we'll be able to see. One really good example of this is uh, something that all of you will have experienced at some point in time, even if you're not aware of it. Um, but if you've ever been to a pub, and tried to hold a conversation with somebody standing next to you. That's actually a really good example of the human ear's ability to pick a, an important signal, so something that it wants to hear, out from a really, really noisy environment. So even though you might be surrounded by other people carrying on conversations, a lot of background noise, you're still able to hear that, that person trying to speak to you and you're able to focus on that conversation. So that's just one example of something that the human ear is actually really, really good at doing. And when it comes to the equivalent of that in the visible, it's actually a lot more difficult to pick signals out of noise in that way. Okay. And um, some of this might be sounding a little bit far-fetched to you, but there are actually examples of blind astronomers today uh, who are using these kinds of techniques to do their research. Um, so the first is uh, Dr. Wanda diaz Macet, uh, who's a Puerto Rican um, astronomer. Uh, she went blind during her undergraduate degree, but decided that she still really wanted to study astronomy and become an astronomer. Um, so throughout her career, she's developed a number of different sonification tools to basically turn data into sound so that she can listen to the data that she wants to study uh, rather than using her eyes. And we also have uh, Dr. Gary Ferran. Um, so Gary uh, actually started off as an X-ray physicist um, working in a, in a particle accelerator in Japan. He lost his sight uh, a couple of years ago due, uh, due to a degenerative eye condition. Um, and he actually decided to retrain as an astronomer. So he's currently finishing off his PhD. Um, and again, as somebody who's totally blind, Gary has had to really think outside the box and find all of these weird and wonderful, quite unusual ways of doing his research. And some of that's involved creating tools uh, to turn his data into sound. And I think the real message here is that both of these astronomers who are blind, because they wanted to do this research, they haven't been able to use the standard suite of tools that exist that most other astronomers can tap into. But because the tools that they need to do their work don't exist, they've had to literally invent them from the ground up. So they've had to spend a lot of time, put a lot of effort into making these tools that are really specific to their needs. Yeah, and that's how, something we're hoping we can fix um, with, with work that we're doing to make it easier for the next generation. So to give an example of where sound might be more beneficial than even visuals, I'm taking an example not from astronomy, but from another field of research. After I met this amazing guy called Stephen Barras in the summer, a, a meeting we hosted. And he told this lovely story about a discovery that was made through sound that wasn't detected using the normal visual representations and the, and the standard algorithms they were using on the computers to analyze the data. 
So we're not going to get into the details of what the data set is, but it's very complex. I'm showing a visual representation of the data on the graph. It's got three dimensions. There's all sorts of a three-dimensional plot. It's very complicated, wiggles, there's different colors, quite hard to understand. But Stephen was sent two data sets of this type that were supposed to be completely identical. So it was two measurements of the same type of data that were supposed to be identical. And what Stephen did was he took that data and he transformed it into a 3D print of a bell. Now again, the details are not so important. The point is that the shape of the bell is determined exactly by the data set that came in. So he made two bells from these two different data sets and they were supposed to be completely identical. But when you listen to the bells, if you hit them, something very interesting was found. So I'm going to play you the sounds of those and somebody can let me know in the chat if this doesn't doesn't sound right or doesn't come across. Oops, I missed. So that was bell one and bell two. I'll play it again. Ah, I keep missing. So hopefully you didn't hear it. Oh dear. When we did our test earlier, we had no problem. <laughs> let me uh, let me try and stop sharing, start sharing again, because when we did our test this morning, we didn't have any any trouble. That's going to spoil quite a lot of the. Uh, <laughs> the following things. Let's try. Did we get it that time? Any ideas, Tracy? Because we, we, we test this this afternoon for, to avoid this problem. <laughs> We did, and it did work. Um, under your settings, uh, what yeah. speaker do you have? Your so you've got your microphone and also your speaker. Is your yeah. speaker set to what it was set to earlier? I think so. It's set to default, but I can try and set it to built-in audio. There you go. Try that. See if that makes any difference. Maybe I'll stop showing. Start showing again, just in case. Let's see if that makes any difference. Any luck this time? Unfortunately, no. I don't know why that's not working. Um, Chris, do you have, um, sorry, as I say, Nick, do you have the same slides? Or is it yourself that's sharing them, Chris? I, I'm sharing them. You're sharing them. Uh, but we, we can, Nick can probably share them. Mm. It's very strange because. Yeah, it worked uh, perfectly earlier. Um, I can, Nick, can I can give you the, the link again somehow. I don't know. Are you there, Nick? I've lost Nick. Sorry, I'm here. Okay. Yeah, I'll, um, I should be able to uh, share. I, I've got, I've already got the link loaded up. Okay. So I'll, I'll stop sharing and see if we have any more luck with Nick. Okay. Sorry about this, folks. <laughs> That's why I wanted to do the test. <laughs> I know, and it works, but unfortunately. Okay, and let's go for. Present. Okay. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Right. How strange, right? Well, Nick, you're in charge of the uh, slideshow now. Fair enough. Okay, so let's listen to that one more time. So. Okay. Thanks, Nick. So hopefully you heard there that these two bells sounded different in pitch. So this was quite a surprise because we were expecting these data sets to be identical, but it turns out that they were not identical and this was only identified by listening to the data. So Stephen went back to the people who had made and analyzed the data and said there's something wrong with the data and it turned out there was some mistakes in the way the data was recorded. So that's a fascinating discovery made through sound. Okay, Nick, do you want to move on? Okay, so we'd like to go on a little tour of, this, of the universe, and we're going to go at each stop on the tour. We're going to introduce a different project that's either using sound or using tactile models to represent the universe. But I just want to have a little warning here. I think this is probably quite obvious to you, but just to be sure, when we talk about the sound of the objects in space, we're not referring to sound. We're referring to the fact we've taken light and turned it into sound. We call that process sonification. So as we play you sounds, this is where the light has been turned into sound. It's not a direct measurement of sound. 
Okay, thanks. So here we're going to go. As I said, we'll go on to different locations, starting on the Earth, working our way out to the outer galaxies, and introduce a new project at each location as we go. Okay. Okay, so the first project we wanted to talk to you about uh, is called The Sky in Your Hands. And it's a planetarium show that was developed by uh, astronomers and public engagement people at the University of Valencia. So it's mostly education and outreach focused. Um, the planetarium show used a combination of sound and tactile models like the one on the right here. So there's basically a half sphere and it has the constellations uh, basically in the position they would be in the night sky sort of laid out in uh, on top of that sphere. And so uh, the show also used uh, directional sound to help people work out which part of the dome the constellation was in. And I think they also may have played sounds for the individual uh, stars in the show as well. So yeah, this really, really nice combination of tactile, visual, and audio. Okay, uh, so next we have a, a show that's very uh, dear to Chris and I. So this is the audio universe tour of the solar system, uh, which uh, and we'll talk about the Strauss code as well. Um, so this is a show uh, which was uh, has been directed by Chris, created by Chris, uh, that I've helped with a little bit as well. Um, this is a planetarium show that we've put together with the help of uh, the blind and vision impaired community, in particular, a, a blind student from Newcastle uh, and a qualified teacher for the vision impaired. Um, in this planetarium show, we take the audience on a journey uh, starting off on Earth and then up into space around the earth and then through the solar system. And what's really special about the show is we developed the sound track first. So we developed all of these sonifications of the motions of the planets, the sound of the earth rotating and the sun bouncing off its surface, the sound of the stars appearing in the night sky as the sun goes down. Uh, and then we added the visuals later. So the whole idea here is that we want people to be able to experience this show uh, just using their ears if that's the only way they can but also there's some visuals to sort of back things up if people can see those as well and it's worth noting as well that um most of the sonifications for this show were created by uh james trayford who's a postdoc at the university of portsmouth he's written this amazing bit of software called strauss um, and there are going to be a lot of really interesting future applications with Strauss. Uh, it's basically able to create uh, sounds that have a lot of spatial characteristics as well, uh, a lot of directional characteristics, um, and you can apply all kinds of interesting things to those sounds to make them really, really unique. Uh, Chris, did you have anything else to add? No, let's play them the little example. Okay, yeah, so we thought we'd give you a sneak peek of one of the sonifications that's included in this planetarium show. Uh, and I should add as well that we're actually premiering this on the 6th of December, and then we're gonna be releasing it for free for anybody to access on the 7th of December. Um, but yeah, this sound that I wanna show you or get you to listen to is the sounds of the stars appearing in the night sky above the very large telescope in Chile in the Atacama Desert. And so the idea is, um, as the sun goes down, the sky gets dark. Of course, the stars are already in the sky, but we can't see them until the sun's light has disappeared. Um, in this case, the volume of the sounds you'll be hearing uh, corresponds to the brightness of the stars. So if it's a louder volume, it's a brighter star. If it's a dimmer, a dimmer star, it'll be a, a lower volume. And the pitch of the notes that you'll be hearing tells us what color those stars are. So if it's a low pitch sound, it'll be a redder star. And if it's a high pitch sound, it'll be a bluer star. So let's have a quick listen to that.
And uh, yeah, I, th I think that's just really, really quite beautiful, but also, yeah, conveys some pretty useful information as well. Yeah, thanks, Nick. And it's all based on, on the video. Oh, I'm sorry. No, no. Fine. That, that always happens. <laughs> I go to the next slide. Okay. It's all based on the real data from, from the stars in the night sky. So I'm going to tell you now about another project, also imagining that we're staying on the Earth. And this is something called Astrios. It's been developed by a blind computer scientist called Iyuma Dekau, who's based in Australia. And he's built this amazing piece of software that can either be accessed through sort of a standard computer operating system or with an iPhone. And it has it taps into astronomical databases from all of the world's biggest telescopes. And the bit I want to focus on is the, the, the part with the app on the phone. And what you can do is you can pick up your phone and you can point to anywhere in the sky and it will tell you which constellation of stars you are uh, pointing at. So it'll read out, so you're over Orion or you're over Cassiopeia. And then if you want, you can listen to the stars in that constellation, similar to what we just heard, but just for that constellation. And then you can zoom in with your fingers and you can find out more information about each individual star, learn about the planets around it. And again, it's tapping into real astronomical databases and there are, that data is presented to you both through sort of talking to you so you can listen to it, but also through sonification as well. So it's really a huge tool which has lots of applications, both for sort of engagement and education, but also potentially for scientific research. Yuma really hopes that astronomers will be able to explore data in this new way and maybe make new discoveries. Thanks, Nick. Move on. Oh yeah, there's, there's just a little snippet of what you do. You can, you can move your phone over the constellation and find out more about the individual constellations. So we move on again. Okay, so over to you, Nick, to leave the Earth. Yep, so we're going to move out into the solar system now uh, and cover a couple of projects that deal with uh, the planets and other things like that. Um, so this is another project that was developed by ast astronomers and public engagement people at the University of Valencia, so our same group as before. Um, this project's called A Touch of the Universe, and they developed these wonderful tactile resources to help people understand what the surfaces of the rocky planets in our solar system are like. So they've made tactile models, uh, spheres that are 3D printable of Mercury, Venus, Earth, Mars, and I believe the Moon as well. Um, and they've chosen sort of key features uh, and basically emphasize those. So if we think about how high the craters are on the moon, for example, um, if we were to print that to an accurate scale, those features wouldn't really be uh, detectable just using our fingertips. So they've stretched the features to make sure that they're more easily detectable, that they stand out more, that they're sort of meaningful when somebody runs their hands over the surface of these, these amazing sort of 3D printed globes. Uh, and so the idea here is to, yeah, to use these models to basically help people with low vision or basically anybody who wants to use these models uh, to learn a little bit about some of the features on those rocky planets in our solar system. Yeah, and thinking again about the solar system, I'm going to talk about another app, again, thinking about sound this time. So this is a project called Astronomy for the Blind and Disabled. It was led from Greece, but it was an EU partnership. And this is a app that's been designed for an Android phone, and its primary audience are blind and vision impaired young, young people. There's many aspects to this project, including some ability to sort of access telescopes and things, but I'll, I'll focus on the app and how the app can be used to explore images through sound. And the idea is you can load up an image, you can trace your finger over the image and you get an audio response depending on what you're touching. So if you're touching a bright part of the image, you get a louder sound. If you're touching a faint part of the image, you get a quieter sound. And if you're touching a redder part of the image, you get a lower note. And if you're touching a bluer part of the image, you get a higher note. Similar kind of philosophy to, that we presented with those stars, but this time you're tracing your finger over an individual image. So what we've got for you on the next slide, Nick, is a little excerpt from their tutorial. So don't worry too much about what the guy's saying, but you'll, you'll be able to watch and listen to this person exploring an image of Jupiter with their finger. Do a bit more volume maybe, Nick.
uh, successive changes uh, of the right. Uh, okay. So it might, I don't know, how, hopefully, it was maybe a little hard to hear, but hopefully you got the impression as, as the, the person using the phone moved their finger over the image, they got these different sounds. So it allows you to interact with the image in a audio way. Okay, let's move on. There we go. So now we're going to move out and think about stars beyond our own solar system. And stars, we often think about stars as these like static objects in the night sky, sort of this constant entity. But actually, all stars change with time. We know stars have lives, they're formed, they evolve, and they die. But even during their lifetime, all stars are changing and varying in their brightness. And a particular type of star that varies a lot we would ref over its lifetime, we call it, uh, refer to as a variable star. And variable stars naturally are good types of data to turn into sound. So you can listen to how that star changes in its brightness over time. And we're going to give you one example of a cataclysmic variable star. These are some of the most dramatic variable stars of the universe. And they really flare up and give these very cataclysmic explosions of light. And this is because there's actually two stars, a compact star, such as a white dwarf, and a, a regular star. And that compact star is heating material off the companion star, and then it flares up in brightness, sometimes because the material ignites and causes this nuclear explosion. So if we move, move on to the next slide, Nick, we'll play you a sonification. Uh, we go one more on the, on the keyboard. We'll play a sonification of this data set that we're seeing here. So this is how the star is varying in brightness as a function of time. It's got these, these like hills going up and down and up and down and up and down through time, and that's how this star is Star is varying. We'll play you a sonification of this data that, that we made a couple of years ago. Excellent. You can play that audio, you can find the, the right place. There we go. There we go. It is playing. I'm losing it a little bit in the in the background noise. I don't know about everybody else. It's still playing? Okay, thanks. Thanks, Nick. We, so hopefully you heard there these sort of whooshes of sound. And that, that is our way of representing how this star is varying in brightness over time. We create this wind effect, and it goes whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. And for me, this is a more in, immersive way of exploring this data than just looking at what's a relatively boring graph. Okay, let's move on. Yep. Um, so we can also think about other kinds of stars that um, vary for different reasons from the one that Chris has just described to us. Um, so one of the reasons we sometimes see stars varying in brightness is because they have planetary transits going on. So basically, uh, these are extrasolar planets, so planets orbiting around those stars that pass between us and the star. And so in doing so, they block a little bit of that star's light. And if we're measuring the light output from that star over a long enough period of time, we can actually measure these dips and start to work out things like how close these planets are orbiting to the stars themselves, how quickly they're moving around, how big they are as well, based on sort of how much of the light they're, they're blocking. Um, and so this is something else that we can also sonify and listen to. And this is an example of where your ears are actually going to be really, really good at picking up a repetitive signal because these planets go round and round and round and round, and they're very periodic. So we're going to be sort of looking for, for a repeating signal here. Oops. And so we thought we'd set you a little bit of a challenge. Um, so when we play this planetary transit, what we want you to listen out for are those dips in the light curve, so those drops in brightness. And we want you to see how many of those you can hear. And so it's either going to be 9, 7, 5, or 3. And rather than giving you the answer straight away, we thought we'd <laughs> let you... Uh, wonder for a little bit. We're going to take a little bit of a break, but first uh, I'm going to play that sound. So have a listen, see how many of those planetary transits you can hear, and we'll give you the answer uh, when we get back from, from our comfort break. Okay. Okay, 
should I play that one more time? Chris? Yeah, play that again. Okay, so I promised you we'd have an answer <laughs> to our poll. Um, I don't know whether people want to post what they thought in the chat really quickly or whether you're happy for us to just tell you. Oh, we've got a seven in the chat. Oh, okay. Just one, just one response. Five or three. All right, go ahead and give them the answer. Okay. Actually, I don't remember, Chris. Do you remember how many there are? <laughs> it's, it's, uh, well, you should show us the graph, and that, that will tell. That's you true. That. That'll that'll tell us. Okay, so <laughs> so we can see seven seven dips there. Um, and you listening to that, you're probably able to hear that the overall uh, frequency was decreasing, and you can definitely see that in this plot as well. But yeah, we've got those um, seven really sort of stark dips in that light curve. Um, so those of you who guessed seven, congratulations. Those of you who didn't guess seven, don't worry. This kind of thing takes a little bit of practice. A lot of the time we're not used to using our ears for stuff like this. So it can take take a little bit of time to to calibrate ourselves to get used to, to listening instead of uh, seeing. Yeah, okay. and so someone asked a similar question in the chat. And actually, I performed a study um, about how good we are at detecting these transits with our ears. And the conclusion we came to is there's huge potential, but we need to be trained in how to do it. So we're kind of trained of, as from young children in how to study visual graphs, but we're not trained how to listen to data. So with that training, we believe that you'll be able to do it just as effectively, if not more effectively with sound. But training in how to do it will be important. Okay, let's move on. So we're now gonna take another step out away and we're going to think about our Milky Way galaxy as a whole. And we're gonna focus on the inner regions and go back to this idea that if we look at these objects in space, with different types of light, infrared light, optical light, we can see different things about that galaxy. So we're going to take some images of the very center of our Milky Way, and we're going to turn them into sound. So if we move on, we will look at these images first. So they're going to look at, we're going to look at and then listen to three images of the very center of our Milky Way. The first one is taken by the Hubble Space Telescope in what we call near-infrared light. So this is light that's just beyond red. If we stare in this type of light at the center of the Milky Way, we see these fuzzy regions of sort of smudges on the image. And what we're actually seeing are regions of what we call ionized gas. These are gaseous regions which show us where new stars are being formed. And we move on to the next image. This is now even further into the infrared. And this is like that image I showed you of Centaurus A. We're seeing the dusty regions around the center of the Milky Way at the moment. There's a lot of dust there and we see these smudges all across the image. But just peeking through, we can see these bright dots, and that's actually the stars just behind this dust. And the, although the optical, the visible light can't get through the dust, the infrared light can just peek through. So we can see, as well as this big fuzz from the dust, just a bit of starlight poking through on there. And then our last image is in the X-rays. And here, like I mentioned before, we're seeing this very hot gas. And if you look in the bottom right-hand side of the image, there's this very bright region in the X-rays. And that's actually the region around the supermassive black hole that lives at the center of our Milky Way galaxy. And that region there is particularly bright in the X-rays. So these are great images. So we're gonna listen now to a sonification of these images produced by a project called the Universe of Sound. This is a collaboration between NASA and a, a group of people called System Sounds based in Canada and USA. And they have a whole suite of amazing, beautiful sound representations of images taken by these uh, telescopes such as Hubble and Chandra. And the way that this is gonna work is we're gonna scroll from left to right across the image. So the, third, the beginning of the sounds is the left side of the image, and then we move our way from left to right across the image. You're gonna hear three different instruments for those three different images that I mentioned, so we'll hear all together. You'll hear individual sort of plucks for the star, the point sources in, in, of light, and then you'll hear this overall drone for all that dust and dust, uh, dust, dust and dust that I described. Okay, Nick, let's take a listen.
So there we go. I think that really creates this beautiful sense of what's at the center of our Milky Way. And just in case it's a bit easier for you to listen to, again, I posted the link to the YouTube video in, in the chat. Okay, let's move on. Okay, so now we're going to move beyond our Milky Way to all of the other galaxies uh, that make up our universe. Uh, and so on the left-hand side here, we've got a picture of a spiral galaxy, which is a galaxy that's the same kind of shape, the same kind of morphology as our Milky Way galaxy. So it has this bulge of stars in the middle, these spiral arms that sort of wind out from that center. On the right-hand side, we have a very different kind of galaxy, which is called an elliptical galaxy. Um, and so these usually contain much older, redder, cooler stars. And they form sort of these uh, big spherical, sort of almost rugby ball shaped collections of stars. Um, and these two look really, really different from each other. These are the kinds of images we'd show to people if we want to really sort of wow them. And we're going to talk about some projects that are looking at ways that we can make these more accessible to people who are blind and vision impaired. Okay, um, so the first is the project that I lead, which is called the Tactile Universe. Um, we also have a, an extension of this project that exists in South America called Astro BVI, where they took some of our resources and helped get them out to teachers and students who are vision impaired in quite a number of countries, actually, in, in South America. Um, but the whole premise of this project is that we wanted to create tactile representations of those beautiful images of galaxies uh, that, that you're probably so used to looking at. Um, on the right-hand side, there are also some examples of how we've used the code that we, we make these images with uh, to make some other images as well. So things like the cosmic microwave background, the image of the black hole in M86, uh, and the cosmic web down in the, the bottom left-hand corner as well. And you can see that these all look really different from each other, but they also have really different tactile feels. And so... Um, by 3D printing these images, we can take them out to, to schools, we can take them out to public events, and we can help people who can't necessarily see these images experience sort of the wonder and, and beauty um, uh, just uh, of these images and of the universe. Yeah, thanks, Nick. And, and I'll just say that the first time I explored these images with my fingers, I really felt like I had a deeper sense of what these galaxies are like. I've been studying astronomy for many years as, as my job, but by feeling the contours of these galaxies, I really felt like I had a, a more deep understanding of these galaxies rather than just looking at the pictures, which is what I've been used to doing all my career. So I've got one more example for you. I hope this comes across. If it doesn't come across, we'll think of a way of sharing it again. Now we're thinking about other galaxies and we're going to talk about events that happen in the universe that are kind of one-off events. We, we call them transient events. And these are things like black holes merging together or, or maybe some sort of explosion. And sonification has a huge potential for identifying these transient events and data because you've got lots and lots of data coming from the telescopes and then suddenly you hear something of interest. And what you want to do if you hear something that might be exciting, say from one type of data, maybe a radio data set, you want to swing all of the telescopes you can onto that patch of sky and study that event as quickly as you can in lots of different wavelengths. And you might have heard about this, for example, when the first gravitational wave was detected. All of the telescopes were the phoned up and said, quick, look at this patch of sky because something exciting has happened there. And sonification might be a good way for us to quickly sift that data by listening to it, maybe while we're doing something else, because it can be going on in the background, going, oh, there was something interesting in that data set. Let's, let's act upon that. So the data set that we've got here is something called a fast radio burst. We don't need the details. It's basically a burst of radio emission associated with some compact objects such as black holes. And on the screen, there's a visual representation of nine of these radio bursts from the same object. And in each of the nine segments, it's time along, along the sort of horizontal axis and its frequency off what we're going to turn into pitch along the vertical axis. So there'll be a lot of noise, but then in that noise, we hear this kind of little, this little whoosh uh, sound that is this fast radio burst. So if we try and take a listen, we'll listen to all nine, and hopefully if the sound comes across okay, you'll hear the signal in the noise.
So I think it's, it's like a little zap sound in the noise there. And, and Nick said to me, every time he hears this, he hears more and more of those signals. So some of them are a bit noisy than others. But as we've been mentioning already, if you get used to listening to the data, you start to be able to pick out. I like that. Sounds a bit like bats. Be able to pick out that signal in that noise as, as we get more and more used to exploring data in this way. OK, thanks. Nick. Let's, let's move on. Oh, we got we got it again. Press just press go again. OK, so we kind of we're going to wrap up a bit here. And where do we go next with this work? So myself and Nick, as well as some of our colleagues, ran a conference in the at the end of the summer called the Audible Universe. And the idea was to bring together astronomers who are interested in sonification with experts in sound design, experts in sound perception, so how do people listen to, to sound, experts in education. And we all came together and we talked about where are we at with this? How well are we doing with turning data into sound? And where should we go next? And it was really a, a sort of a kickoff meeting to think about how to make good progress in this field of research. So if we just bring up the words on the slides for me. So some of the goals that we wanted to achieve moving forward was to develop standard accessible tools. So if people are looking at using sound to explore data, particularly those who are blind and vision impaired, they don't have to reinvent these tools again. Nick said at the beginning, he mentioned two astronomers who had to create these tools from scratch. Let's move beyond that and create a set of standard tools so people can come in and start using them without having to recreate it. We also want to achieve this multi-sensory learning to, to make it more common in the classroom because everybody benefits from exploring information in multi-sensory ways. It's not just for people who may be blind or vision impaired. Everybody gets a better sense of what's going on if they explore it in different ways. So let's try and have a big goal to make it more common to explore multi-sensory education. And the other kind of thing that we, we want to work towards, and there's some questions being about this, can we untap this potential for scientific discovery through sound? We really think it's there. I showed you a, an example where a discovery was made through sound. But at the moment, we're in the early stages of this in astronomy, in seeing how we can really put into practice this potential and make scientific discoveries. So as this group of people who are interested in this, we're trying to think now, how do we move forward? What research do we need to do to untap that potential? And maybe in a few years' time, we'll be hearing about all of these discoveries that were made using sound rather than exploring the data through visual means. So I, I snuck in a sneaky, sneaky extra slide, Nick, because I, <laughs> I wanted to, in the last minute and a half, give you our trailer for our show, which will be released on December the 7th. Yep, and I'm, I'm going to block my ears because I hate the sound of my own voice. <laughs> Welcome to the Audio Universe Tour of the Solar System. Join me. Captain Lambert, as we fly around the solar system and turn the light from the stars, planets and the moon into sound. I'm Dr. Nick Bond, your astronomer guide. Let's discover how we don't have to rely on sight to study space. So with that, we wrap up and we will present you with our take home message one more time. Hopefully we've convinced you that there is a huge potential for multi-sensory approaches to astronomy education and research with benefits for both accessibility and scientific discovery. Thank you very much. <laughs>